My name is Maxine Brahm. I'm your MC for tonight. Before, um, so let's start the night with um, asking Annie Liz Hayden to come forward and do our Welcome to Country. I um, feel a little bit overwhelmed to be in this space, really. Um, place of unions, <laughs> strikers. Um, I think it's great, though. And if you say there's history there, I really came with a thought in the back of my mind that I want to talk to you in the space of probably a couple of minutes about the history of our mob who've been striking, striking and striking for more than 200 years. I'm really honoured to be here. <laughs> Strong unions need booger yogas. The union needs strong women. That's booger yogas is strong in our language. And the unions over the years have had a powerful presence and I know that they've walked. And as I said a long time ago, our people have walked along here before concrete was here, but they walked these streets and they walked doing their fights for whatever reason that they struggle for. And so our people have walked many pathways, the um, pathways of looking for what's right for our people. And, um, yeah, the struggle continues. Like we strike when the iron's hot, so when there's an opportunity to meet with a minister, um, somebody's in the door saying this or that about our needs, no matter what they are, we use whatever platform we can find to speak our truth. We have to use whatever platforms are available to speak our truth. If we don't, we don't have the opportunities. You can create a forum, make a space for a black woman or a black man to walk up there and give their peace, as you have done tonight. I'm quite honoured to be among these amazing women. And, um, yeah... They have walked many paths, the bitty paths that they've walked on, as strong women doing their part for us. And to represent Aboriginal people in the place of the union, I think they are mudich, they are solid. Whatever your conversations are tonight, I don't know. I don't know. But as you walk this pathway, I hope that you will strong, if you haven't already, that you will form strong or stronger unions with the Aboriginal community. Because if we don't have voices out there, we don't get heard. If we get heard, we're not listened to. And if we're not listened to, we're cast aside. You know, oh, there's that rousy, rowdy um, woman over there. Look at her with her hair hanging out. She's, she's just nothing but noise. And they put us down as women, you know, when we try. You try walking in a black woman's shoes sometime. Let me tell you that seeing these women here tonight and you've given them that prominent place is absolutely marvellous. Thank you for asking me here. I'm honoured. I currently work at a college in uh, Leederville. It's a bit unique. Um, a population of 700 students, 60 Aboriginal students. That program that is currently run at that college is has been going for 20, uh, 19 years, next year's 20 years. So the college pays for Aboriginal students out of their own funds 
to be educated. It's a great, it's a great program. It's not just tick the box. It's, it's about results. It's about education. But it's also about believing in our Aboriginal students and their parents and encouraging them on that journey. That's one part of... I grew up in a strong um, union labour background, Aboriginal family, strong, uh, large number, and I live what I was taught. That's enough about me. On our panel tonight, we have Michelle Nelson, uh, who recently stood in the state election for Central Wheat Belt, and believe me, she give that candidate that won it a good go for her money, and good on you, Michelle. Um, <laughs> sitting next to Michelle, we have Colleen Haywood AM. Now, Colleen um, is one lady that, one of the many ladies that I admire. Uh, I look up at Colleen and I think, good on you, lovey. Over here, I have the lovely Davina, Deanna, our um, newly elected member for the Kimberley, for the Labor Party. Good on you, Divi. Um, we do have connections. I'm actually her auntie. <laughs> no, that's, that's not why. And I was really delighted when Rebecca called and said, oh, we've got Davina, yes. So this question was, um, could we speak for a maximum of one minute to introduce ourselves? And I thought, if I was going to pick a couple of words that I think describe me, it would be educator. I started my working life as a teacher. But I think everything that all of us do in all aspects of our lives is about education. It's about teaching others and bringing them with us because they have a better understanding of whatever is the issue. Advocate, you've heard um, that I was uh, a senior vice president um, with the State School Teachers Union. Before that, I was um, an organiser with them. I was in the days when Unions WA was the Trades and Labor Council. I was a TLC delegate. Um, I was a junior vice president in the affirmative action uh, position. Um, and uh, nationally, I'm a life member of the Australian Education Union. So I guess they're my um, union credentials in terms of advocacy. And I think regardless of anything else that I've um, done over time, for instance, the last 10 years when I was a senior academic at ECU, words like academic never sat easily with me. I always wanted to myself described as an activist rather than an academic. I think it's much more doing and being um, than just being called something. And nowadays, um, I'm a retiree. Um, so thank heavens for good super. Thank heavens for industry funds, big tick for the union movement there. And, uh, and of course, in the context of um, some of tonight's conversation, uh, none of us gets to retire comfortably unless you've got a good job with good pay and good job security. And that, I think, is fundamental to the union movement. Thank you. Thank you, Colleen. Michelle, would you like to take one minute and introduce yourself? To I'll, I'll do my best. First of all, I want to acknowledge my elders past, present and future. I certainly want to acknowledge Mum and Dad, Honey Lizzie and Uncle Jim sitting in the room here today. Um, I want to acknowledge my mum um, for um, allowing me to inherit her strength and wisdom and knowledge to be the woman that I am today. Um, she did 27 years in community service for Father Brian Morrison. Um, we lived on second-hand clothing. Um, we lived on limited food vouchers and, you know, traditional food. And that was the way we were reared up. So our culture is what we are built on. Um, as you know, um, I, what people don't know is we should be very grateful for the Trades Union, um, union 
because they are the founders of the partnership that set up Durba Urigan Health Service more than 47 years ago. They gave us a building just down the road. Um, we were, there was an old van that was been delivering health service with three people um, to the fringe, fringe dwellers on, living on the, the banks of the river. And it's through the sponsorship of the hospital, of the Royal Perth Hospital, Fiona Stanley and others, Dr Breed, that started Durba Urigan Health Service. And Durba, it was called the Perth Aboriginal Medical Service, just two doors down, down um, started off with a $300 grant that the state government gave us because they thought that's all we were worth. Culture will never, ever die. Our wisdom will never go away. Our heritage, our storylines, our pathways, what our ancestors have set up for us will never disappear. You know, I gave 30 years to Aboriginal affairs in a diversity of native title, Aboriginal health, Department of Housing, you name it, I did it. Disability Commission, I did the whole role. There are gaps in the central wheat belt. Lack of essential services in the wheat belt. The disparity of life expectancy between the Aboriginal people and the Wadula people, I mean, no disrespect, it's not closing. And we've got to get better at it. And the only way we can get better at it is influence from the inside out. And we've been saying this from, for a long, long time that, you know, we've been advocating that we need to have designated seating for Aboriginal people sitting inside Parliament to educate, to guide, to lead, to provide expertise, advice to provide wisdom. Let's work together. Let's work in harmony. Let's make significant changes. Let's walk this journey together. Murich Krut, strong heart. Wangadi Danju, walk together on this journey with us. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. I'm now going to pass it over to Davina. Davina, can you give us a snapshot um, on... Yep, thank you. Um, firstly, I'd like to um, thank you for the wonderful acknowledgement and, and acknowledge the elders past, present and the people of this land that I'm privileged to be on. Um, as you know that I've just been elected into parliament, so I'll probably be on your country a lot. So if you could... Um, Make sure I feel safe in this country, that's good. I consider myself a um, daughter, a mother, a grandmother, and a granddaughter. That has been the four foundation roles that have driven me throughout my life. I, as Annie Maxine has just said, we, sh we have a strong, um, a similar bloodline. I'm related to her through my grandmother who had played a major, major role in my life. Um, she was kind of not an ordinary person, but um, she was an activist in her own way and she always um, told you like it was, even no matter how offensive it was. And I never really knew or understood that um, until I got older because her yakking at my parents, this and that, this and that. I realised later on it was she was sticking up for the rights of the child. She was sticking up... She was going against her son and his wife to make sure that me, as the eldest child of eight, was having a childhood and not only just taking up roles that was forced upon me because of the lack of responsibility from my parents. They're not all bad. They're good now. They must have simmered down with age. Um, I was born and bred in the Kimberley. Some people say that I'm very um, narrow-minded or focused because I've, I've lived nowhere else but the Kimberley, but that is what drove me um, really hard throughout my life to stick up. So my other word that I describe is a conduit or an advocate 
I never call myself a leader. Um, I always would advocate for people who, fit, who I felt that they didn't have um, a loud enough voice or, or was too shame or something to get it right. And I also made sure in all the roles I did through social emotional well-being, native title, uh, community development, um, I did a bit in the education team. I made sure that there was two-way communication, not only, um, you know, passing that message on to those people that were considered the authorities, but also making sure what the authorities were saying to um, our mobs was clear and understood, which was some of your points. People, our people do tend to, like, smile and nod and, like... But really, I, I made it my mission in throughout my old work is like asking that question, making sure that you understand this is what it means. This is what it means. No matter what she say, this is what it means. You are okay? You are okay with that? I think that's really important, and that's what drove me. Um, I I um I was very privileged to have gone in the space through my work to work with um a lot of people throughout the Kimberley. The Kimberley is the size of two Victorias, just for context, and that's the size of the electorate. Um, so it was a lot of hard work, but I was lucky that I was well networked already through the roles I had um, in the last 20 years, working in peak bodies or just being, you know, because my family from the south of the Kimberley, my in-laws from the north, so everywhere in between we're always, you know, walking through other people's country and making sure we say hello, goodbye, everything all right, anything I can help you with. And that's how it is. So I guess in short, and end, because you're going to ask me the past question too, um, I, I was very privileged to be taught and um, mentored by the old people in the Kimberley. And I understand the um, fights that went on for years and years and years about what they thought was right, what they thought was justice and what they needed to see. And I'm a big advocate, and one of my pa passions is about young people. I'm I'm not I'm not old no I'm not old as in an elder, but I'm not a spring chicken either. So I fit in this middle category where I will be there fighting for um, young people, young people because they are the future and they need to be strengthened and allowed be allowed to have that presence and command. Let our old people have rest from having that journey. We accept and, and acknowledge what they've done with great respect, but they're tired now. It's time for our young people to step up and really push the journey. In regards to unions, it's my understanding that um, I was quite privileged to be tapped and asked to run too. I never thought of myself as a leader, as I said, but um, I really thought about it and I guess the role that I'm taking on down here is the role that I've been doing all my life, is making sure the voices from up there be heard down here when it comes to making decision, guiding policy, you know? You wanna make rules for everybody, no disrespect, but you know, the metro nut doesn't count up there, you know? It does, that's the furthest thing from my people mind up there. I'm here for everybody, but you know, I want to make sure there are fair and just decisions being made that takes into consideration um, for our mobs up there. And one of you's raised the point, I wrote it down and I forgot, but yes, we do need to have um, a voice and a collective because Indigenous affairs and Indigenous people do not um, have one issue. You know, the government is made up of silos, education, housing, health. But Indigenous Affairs is affected by every single portfolio, environmental, land, health, everything. So, you know, you, you put one policy there, it's my job, I see it as my job to ask the question, how does that policy affect Indigenous people? How does that policy affect not only the Kimberley people, but Indigenous people in this state? Past questions. So, Colleen, I'm going to throw this to you. Yeah. <laughs> what are the significance of the Pilbara Strike for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? For me, um, I was thinking when Auntie Liz was doing her welcome, and thank you, always, Liz. Um, Aboriginal people are masters of passive resistance. Um, I look sometimes at the number of times that you see in movies or even ads or we strike in our 
um, everyday conversations, the vernacular nowadays of, yeah, 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 no. We've all heard it. I think we invented that. Um, very often you will find Aboriginal people who will agree because they think that's the expectation. They think that it's being polite. It doesn't actually mean we're in agreement. And keeping that in mind and really testing and teasing out the, the matters with which we do agree is always going to be critical to anything moving forward. For me, um, the Pilbara strike really said there's an opportunity here for Aboriginal people to take a stand as well as non-Aboriginal people to stand with us. That's really important because we don't always get those opportunities of that kind of shared space where we're all thinking alike. Or we might think alike, but we don't necessarily demonstrate that in our action. So for me, there was that. I think for Aboriginal people coming out of that process, there was a growing confidence that we weren't alone, that there was support that there remains support. And those things, I think, can't be underestimated. In the Aboriginal space, similar, I guess, to the gender space and any other campaign area that needs to be ramped up, I always look to what are the lessons, if you like, that we've learned that showed success in a different campaign area and are we able to modify and apply those in this one? I think for me, this was a great example. Of um, lastly, unions, my, my, I heard that the unions was very supportive in the Nukunba um, movement where there was the strike the birth of the Land Council 40 years ago, but that whole collective movement of coming together to stand up for your rights and making sure they're not pushed over was strongly supported, and I heard on different versions, that it was started by the unions. But, um, yeah, that's my answer to the past. I'm going to move into another question now, and it, it's how the Australian government's policy of stolen wages affect current Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? So, um, I'll, try and, I'll try and do the brief thing. Um, this is in the context of many Aboriginal people not even having their birth dates properly and accurately registered. Um, a couple of years ago, I uh, assisted what was then the Department for Aboriginal Affairs, who were working through the very meagre, as in top dollars was $2,000 per person, regardless of how many wages, how much in wages had been stolen. That was the extent that they could do because it was limited by legislation. Um, I was pleased that the officials in that department did everything they could to get people over the line to get that amount and that every person in the room acknowledged how inadequate it was. So to see it back on the agenda is really important. One of the things in this context about age and registration of birth date and so on is the number of applications we had a look at that, lo and behold, usually it was, you know how horses have 1st of August? We have 1st of July. You know, like the, the number of people who just, oh, well, we know they're born because there they are, that's the date that we'll nominate instead of the care and attention that should have been given to people. So when we can't even register birth dates properly, it's certainly not going to flow on to a proper registration of who's working and what they should have earned and what the recompense and compensation now should be. The other context for that in the current context is we don't inherit wealth. 
Now, lots of non-Indigenous people will also think they don't inherit wealth. But in fact, they do. Most. They inherit whatever mum and dad or aunts and uncles or benevolent grandparents or whatever leave in terms of their will. Sometimes it's financial. Sometimes it's property. Sometimes it is... Um, a focus and a different kind of resource like education or like um, a network where you can already secure a job. There are other things like that that count in terms of inheritance. We don't do that. So we are always starting from zero on a good day rather than starting backwards. And that's a large part of why getting this right is so important. I'll use my mum as, as a, an example. Unbeknown to me, when I applied for my birth certificate, I found that my mum had two different birth certificates, registered birth certificates. So we didn't know which was the correct date of her birth date. She worked tirelessly doing cleaning, farm hand, at the age of 13. She is a stolen generation. And it was the churches that registered a lot of our Aboriginal people. So whatever date that they put down, and even though it may not have been the correct date, and the name that some of our Aboriginal people were named is not their true name. And not the correct, the spellings of their names are completely different as well. Unbeknown to me, when I went and got my birth certificate, um, on, two, on one occasion, I found that I had a sister that was deceased. And I thought, this can't be my mum's birth certificate. And I took it back and I took, I said, this is not my mum's birth certificate because I wasn't aware that my mum had this baby that lived for five hours and she named the baby. And then they gave me another birth certificate and then I find I had another sister that lived for three hours. And she got back to Meriden where we lived on the reserve. She had to go back and help farmers, wives, raise their children and left my older siblings to raise our children, her children. So where was the fairness and the equality in that? And she came home with nothing, absolutely nothing. So that was why I, we, we tried very hard, vigorously, to campaign to have her compensated but because she'd passed on and we didn't have a statutory declaration from her, we couldn't claim her stolen generation. A number of people in the same situation, unfortunately. I'm going to move on now to our present question. I'm going to direct this at you, Davina. Um, what, are you, what are the current social justice movements stated by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that, it, that are the general populations are not hearing? that the general population are not hearing? Um, I think that um, if we're talking about the present right now, um, you know, I think there's, there's a massive movement at the moment across the nation on, on a few issues. Um, do people know about it? Uh, yes, I think they do but some people don't choose to acknowledge as well. You know, you've got the Uluru Statement from the Heart and the Voice to Parliament, you know. It's, it's been a long time. I, I was quite privileged to be part of the dialogues in the Kimberley and also at, um, I remember meeting you in Uluru. My name was on that statement. So I've been lucky enough to be part of that movement and I've been watching it and supporting it and talking it in the region and that's what we need to do is um, keep supporting 
you know, that same messaging. And, you know, Thomas Mayer, Dean Park, and they're all going around and they're doing good work. They are going around and are strengthening a collective, which is what it's all about, a collective of people, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, with the same goal. Um, that's one of the um, movement that I'm sure it makes news for people that look for it, but there is a whole lot of people out there that are, are not sure or fully informed of exactly what that means or what's being asked. Um, that's one of it. The other thing is, you know, the 30th anniversary of deaths in custody. Um, we're still talking about it 30 years later, you know, and, and you know, in the last month, there's been already, you know, four other deaths in custody. There are some people that have inquiries that still are not resolved yet, you know? People say, oh, that's yesterday's news. Well, actually, it's not because it's still happening. It's never going to be yesterday's news until something is resolved. Um, I think what's not being recorded directly, correct me if I'm wrong, to me, another social movement that's really happening is um, the movement of women, black, white, and, you know, all kinds. The, the movement of women standing up in their places, especially up in the Kimberley, where they're standing up and they're really un unifying to stand up and say, give us a go now. You men had your turn. We did it your way for 30 years. You've made some changes. Can we take a step back and think outside of the box and just take a different approach? Just hold up for a minute. I was lucky enough on Thursday, there's a movement where I come from where there was a round table, Kimberley Women's Round Table. This is where women from across the Kimberley came together and were like saying, what do we want to do? We want to form a council. We want to know, you know, these non-Indigenous people are blaming us for this and that, the crime, the, the bad things that are happening, but they're not focusing on the positives. You know, how can we stand up as a collective? How can we make this whole community better for everyone? We will stand up. We, we're mothers, we're nurturers, we know. Try it our way. So that's one movement that I think is um, going, but something that's really passionate is the movement of young leaders. Young leaders coming up, coming through and really wanting to come and, and take on the fight in this generational shift. There's a generational shift and we have to embrace it. It's moving so fast over the last 20 years, things have changed. The way we do business has changed. Um, we're not losing sight of the vision of, the, of, of what needs to be done. We're just uh, tweaking it in the methodology of how it needs to be done in this new way, like the Pilbara strike. You know, there was a massive strike that was done with no phones, no radios, but we live in a society of social media now, you know? People back home, over 2,000 kilometers away, probably already know what I'm doing right now, you know? Yeah, so, so I think um, the present is, is, a, is a scary yet quite exciting time because there's a lot of things happening and it'll be interesting to watch and um, analyze in 10 years' time by the academics. Good one. Thank you, Davina. Okay, I'm going to move on to our last lot of questions. It's about the future. So, in recent years, we've seen increase in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander employment rates. In comparison to non-Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, but there's been very low employment participation rate. What do you think the case is? And do you think the trend is to be continued? Who would you want to start? Me? Uh, no? Open. Who wants to take it? So, having worked for one of the claimant groups for Native Title, Nalakala Budja, Mum, you would know, um, we have seven mining industries down there. Um, we, Nalakala Budja, it out of the six claimant groups throughout the WA settlement or the, or the Noongar settlement, Nala Kalabuja was the only claimant group that had a community partnership agreement with, 
you want Grant Buddington Gold. The issue was you're dealing with two calibre of Noongar kids, Noongar people, and mature age. So you had the willing but unable. So when I say the willing, these are the people that want to work but can't work because they have a criminal history or they don't have a driver's licence or they have drug and alcohol problems or they have antisocial problems or they don't have the skill sets to work. And then you have the unwilling but able. So these are the people that have the skills, have the licence, have the police clearances, can have the skill sets, have the family social support, but don't want to work. One of the things we've found during this time is that, yes, we've had an increase in employment, but if you look up in the central wheat belt area that I was, there are no job opportunities. We have opportunities now through our settlement to have our own commercial entities, to buy our own hospitals, to have our own paramedics, to have our own hotels, to have our youth, you know, learn and work. Don't make decisions for us on behalf of us, but without us. Because if you don't have us sitting around and guiding you and directing you on some of these policies, they're not workable. Okay, I'll, my last question for tonight, my last question, and I'm going to ask this to you, Colleen, given your history with Union. How, can, how do you see us, how can unions better support Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander workers? Um, I think... In, so this is very union specific now. Um, lots of awards increasingly have specific clauses that encourage Aboriginal employment. Um, I'm not too sure, though, how well we do it in terms of whether or not or the extent to which those clauses cover cultural obligations. I'm not sure how far we go, we the union movement go, in terms of ensuring that position descriptions, JDFs, etc., for identified positions, even given um, uh, what's been said, actually free people to meet cultural obligations. I, I find it amazing that someone can work in an identified position and given no time to do Aboriginal stuff. I, I find that ludicrous. And yet I know that it happens. <laughs> we all know that it happens. Uh, so there are some things like that. Um, one of the things that I think um, unions and employers will find really challenging is still the catch-up that has to happen in terms of non-Indigenous Australians understanding more about our cultural obligations. We don't have only one mother. We have more than one mother. Um, my children are not only my children, they are the children of my brothers and sisters, etc. So if someone comes with an application for bereavement leave because their mother is passed, they don't need an employer that says, no, hang on, your mother passed last year. You're not having any more. You know, there's a lot of that kind of catch-up that still has to happen. So it's about non-Indigenous um, employers and advocates understanding more about our culture. It's about ensuring that um, our JDFs, uh, award clauses and so on actually recognise that as well and more than recognise that they enable and facilitate it. I think they are big issues with which we're still grappling. Um, thank you. Thank you. Davina, 
please. I just wanted to make a quick comment because I did write something down on this question. Um, I just wanted to say, because I didn't know it existed, uh, thank you for inviting me, um, the Aboriginal Committee of Unions WA, but also events like this is is um, a way of helping Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people as well. Um, events like this teach each other about our culture, your culture, what we deal with, how do you empathise, and also, you know, um, it it ultimately is collective action and, and the same goal, you know, making better outcomes for everyone. And, and we start on the back foot, so people, unions coming to support people like us by way of understanding and learning and educating and truth-telling is, is one way of sharing that message. That can be one, one way that unions help more, is always sharing that message and having awesome people on awesome Aboriginal committees like yourself. Thank you, Davina. That's have me having my, my say as usual. I have two questions from the floor. Any takers? Highest bidder, please. I, I want to say that um, I want to acknowledge you, Liz, and, and remember your beautiful sister, Jenna, my dear friend, she was. The trade union movement has always fought for justice. It has always had a social justice agenda from way from where it started in Australia. They've fought for the Aboriginal people. They've fought for the Irish. They've fought for everyone who's been downtrodden. And years ago, I belonged to a union and I'm, I'm a life member of that union. And we fought for cultural leave for Aboriginal people. We fought for what was fair and just. Joe, you would know. Um, because that's the trademark, that's a footprint of trade unionism in the world. In terms of Aboriginal Australia, there is no single view. In every sector, every portfolio, every industry, whatever you want to term it, it's seen as a strength to have diverse views around the table. But somehow, on so many issues, we're supposed to have a single view. And, it, and frankly, it, it don't happen. It doesn't happen. It's, and, it, and it wouldn't be healthy if it did. I think with this, we just have to persist. There are different views. Davina and I will share one because we've had a similar experience in terms of actually getting to the Uluru Statement. Some of the breakaway is due to people's frustration that not enough change is happening soon enough, so maybe if they did something different, it would prompt change. So it's not for bad uh, intent in terms of different groups pushing different angles on it. I think with any speakers that are coming, we just have to persist in terms of getting people in the room so that they can share in the conversations. They might go away with, a, with the same view or a different view. They might not change their mind because of the conversation. But you can bet your bottom dollar they never will if they don't have the conversation. So we've just got to keep talking. We've got to keep having people in the room, and we've got to keep appreciating that people will have different views and that it's OK for you to form your own. Regardless of actually now, because the Uluru Statement is an invitation to every person in the Australian population, every person in the Australian population is allowed to form their own view. It may or it may not be exactly the same, lots of the points will be the same. That's okay. So long as we keep moving forward in a concerted way and hopefully as together as we can be. 2007, the West Australian Government handed down its report in the Recommending a Human Rights Act and I believe Colleen sat on the panel uh, that re recommended that. Um, this was shelved because the Commonwealth Government was expected to take up one. Regardless, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights requires states to sign up the 
certain elements and it's in the WA Labor State platform. What do we need to do to see this enacted in WA and what will this mean from an Indigenous per uh, perspective, both for current and future generations? Um, for me, uh, that 2007 process was actually a really good one. Statewide consultation, what are the views in, of anyone and everyone, individuals, organisations, government agencies, what could we see in a state-based Human Rights Act? There was a final report. I still think it's a good report. Um, it probably needs to be refreshed, but not the same lengthy process. But the fact that it was shelved because we were promised a federal act to cover human rights, and then when we didn't get it, we didn't drag that off the shelf, I think was weak, quite frankly. Um, look, like others in this room, and I know that it doesn't necessarily go together, but so that you know where my thinking is, not only do I support unions, but on many things, most things, I support Labor governments. That doesn't mean they always get it right. Lately, I've been doing some work in terms of looking at how government spends its money contracting services in the human services area. These are areas that, are, that would be covered under a Human Rights Act. And I cannot see anything that actually goes to improving outcomes on the ground. Processes get improved, outcomes don't. And that's why we have government departments and I've got to say, lots of community organisations, including Aboriginal community controlled organisations that keep growing and requiring more money to sustain themselves when what they're actually doing is keeping people in poverty and need. And I think that if it takes a Human Rights Act to really start to shake that, it'll be a good thing. I just wanted to say on that last point is something that I totally agree with and is one of the things that I've been saying up where I come from, that there is hundreds of thousands of dollars being injected into that region, yet the outcomes have not improved. And, you know, I would rather give money to one or two working... Um, Organ effective organisations that are achieving outcomes rather than to look fair, give even amount of money to 10 different um, organisations, as callous as it sounds, because, you know, um, spitting money at people is not going to solve anything um, and we really need to have some accountability because my pet hate is about money going into organisations and it's building empires rather than service delivery. Thank you. If I might just add to that as well, um, one of the contentious issues we have is in an Aboriginal community control organisation, the funding contract or agreements is always based on outputs as of, as as for, as as outcomes. To us, the, they don't match. Thank you, ladies. I really appreciate your time tonight. On behalf of Unions WA and our Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Committee, I want to thank each and every one of you for attending tonight. Our panellists, thank you very much, ladies. <laughs>